when I did chores as a child, I used to make the chores go by faster by imagining that a famous dignitary was coming to the house. Uh -huh. Now, I could have imagined the monkeys who I was really into at the time, but the one I pictured the most was the President of the United States. And I would ma imagine how I would like take a toothbrush and you know scour the grout and make it clean white and go into the backyard and arrange some flowers just so. So I can only imagine what Martha is feeling right now. The Messiah, the King, the healer, the teacher is coming to her house. No matter, no, no wonder she wants to get everything just right. Scripture tells us that this is Martha's house. And I find that interesting in a patriarchal society. This is Martha's house. And Martha wants to make sure everything goes the way it should. She is a doer, an organizer, a revolutionary. And she wants this movement to come together. She wants to support Jesus. And let me just confess, I deeply identify with Martha. I am the oldest woman in a family of five children, a family that was fairly chaotic, fun, but chaotic. And I took on parental type responsibilities at an early age. My youngest brother even called me Mama Jen Jen. My sister, however, was more like Mary. And so when uh, Martha goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, get her to help me. Can't you see how overwhelmed I am? That's exactly what I used to say to my mom. Mom, Wendy's not helping with the dishes. To which my mom would say something very similar to Jesus. You know, just get them done. And, you know, well, actually not similar, maybe a little bit different. So I really relate to Martha. And honestly, I don't like this passage very much. And so, of course, it would fall on the lectionary assignment on the day that I have to preach. I can see from your faces that many of you feel the same way about this story. In fact, lots of famous people have not liked this story. So if you're like me, you're not alone. The writer Rudyard Kipling grumbled about this passage he saw it as an excuse for supposedly spiritual people to be lazy and entitled and make everyone else do all the work. He wrote, the Marys of the world have cast their burden upon the Lord, and the Lord, he lays it on Martha's sons. After grumbling about this story for years, along with Rudyard Kipling, I have found a less polarizing and more inviting way to see the story. And I don't think Jesus is criticizing Martha or her mode of serving the kingdom of God. This story is not a vote for prayer and detached spirituality over and against faith and action. I think it is a reminder of how these two modes of being fit together hand in glove. In fact, the story of Mary and Martha falls between the, the Good Samaritan, which is a parable about how to put your faith in action, and an exposition on the Lord's Prayer. So it falls between putting your faith in action and the importance of contemplation and prayer and bringing things to God. As I said, I've always understood Jesus' words as a rebuke, but now I'm beginning to understand that Jesus sees Martha in her state of anxiety and frustration. And now I see how he speaks to her soothingly and he says, Martha, Martha, you're so worried and upset about so many things. Come on over here and put your feet up. I want you to be with me. I want you to sit with me. I just want to enjoy your presence. I imagine him smiling knowingly and lovingly Maybe even that knowing gleam in his eye. Look, I know how you are. It's just time for you to sit. Let's be together. We won't always have to find. I picture Martha stopping midway through the room, taking a deep breath, 
smoothing down her flyaway hair as it's been swept from the ponytail or the bun and settling down, laughing knowingly. I know how I am. Now it's time for me to sit and enjoy the fruit of all of the preparation I've made. It's time for us to see each other. When my son Eli was three or four years old, he was like Jesus in my life. Like, almost I called him my Buddha baby. He was my spiritual discipline um, in my midst. I'm a consummate multitasker. My brain is always going. And he would sit with me, and as soon as I started, my mind started to wander to my to-do list, or I might surreptitiously check my phone for messages. He would take his two little pudgy hands, put them on either side of my cheek, and take my head, and focus it on him, right on his eyes. It was highly annoying, but highly effective. And I read that as God saying to me, Chad, be present. This moment will not always be with you. Be present. So often we all reside in a state of anxiety and distraction, our minds racing forward to what we need to do next or looking at back at things we could have done better. Even now, I imagine half of us are thinking about everything we have to do after worship. True confession, my mind races. And so if you are doing that, I completely understand. I have known some Marys in my life, and they have inspired me. One of them is my Uncle Jack. He's a cardiologist, but midway through his career, he realized that his patients could not be treated simply by the use of medication or by surgery or any sort of dietary intervention. What he recognized was that so many people coming to him with heart problems were stressed. And he began to put together the psychosocial, the spiritual with heart health. And he even wrote a book about it. I have seen him work, walk into the chaos of an emergency room. And because of who he is, the whole room, which is bustling and chaotic, settles and focuses. And at family gatherings, my Uncle Jack is the one who sees. He sees what's happening with people. My family, like I said, we can be all over the place, all jockeying for attention, all trying to show how to get the meal done, what needs to be done, and, you know, everybody listen to me, that kind of thing. And at a recent gathering, I was really struggling. I had some things that were going on in my life. I hadn't even told my Uncle Jack what was up. But he was observant. He was subtle. And he was seen. He came up to me in a side hallway and he put his hands on both my shoulders. He looked me in the eye and he said, I am so proud of you. And you can tell to this day, that was three years ago, that's a ripple effect in my life. While others outdid each other in the kitchen and clamored for attention, my uncle remained present to the spirit of God. He could see what was happening and he wanted to connect on a deeper, more compassionate level. Our society is often more affirming of the Martha side. We all like to brag about how much we're getting done. How are you doing? Oh, I'm just so busy. I just got all these things done. Our news programs and our consumer economy keep us restless and anxious. Maybe I don't have enough. Maybe I need to do more. Maybe I need that thing, right? The news, they play off of our fears. But contemplatives like the Catholic priest Richard Rohr urge us to resist what they call the hypnotic trance of our modern culture, which is hell-bent on distracting and keeping us busy. So when Jesus says, Mary has chosen the better part, I think he is reminding Martha and giving her permission to break that hypnotic trance and enter into a statement, into a, um, a um, state of awareness with herself and others. Martha suddenly sees that perhaps it doesn't matter how clean the house is or even how good the food is. What matters is to be present with those she loves, to sit at Jesus' feet, and to enjoy the hospitality she herself has made happen. And too often we miss it. Our culture has us in a wild frenzy. 
telling us we need to be more, to have more. But God has other plans for us. This story is also a reminder of the ways in which our striving and our activity and perhaps of though they may appear can actually be a distraction from what Jesus calls the better part. And in these tumultuous and conflictual times, it can be difficult yet all the more important to practice this deep, compassionate, loving presence, even with our enemies. Now there is a member of my family I'm sure you guys, none of y'all have this, but we don't get along. We often spar and debate, particularly about politics. So when I go home for the holidays in recent years, things have been fairly contentious. In fact, my family conspires to keep us each at opposite room, ends of the room. That's how tense it's gotten. So on a recent visit, I decided to put my Mary side into practice. And before walking through the door, I spent some time praying and reflecting on what was happening in this relationship. Yes, we have different political views, but something else was going on. As I prayed, I realized I had a beef from growing up with Southern men who often felt like they silenced me. And he reminded me of that. And for him, what I realized with him was he was such an affable person, he really wanted everyone to love him, no matter what. And as I began to detect that he just had a lot of anxieties around uh, whether or not I would respect him. So before walking in the door, I decided to really show compassion for his fears and insecurities. I think he must have prayed as well, because by the end of the, the family gathering, after years of bickering and conflict, we had made amends. We were hugging each other in the kitchen. The family was nervous and they were like, oh my gosh, they are hugging each other in the kitchen. <laughs> Such a relief to everyone. And I thought about everything I had missed over the years. Jesus is inviting us to live each day as though it were our last. In this moment, this very moment, is all we truly have. Are we present in it? Or are we worrying about things that don't really matter in the long run? Corinthians talks about how we can give away all we have to the poor, deliver our bodies to be burned. I can win every debate. I can make every political argument. But if I have not love, I am a noisy gun and a clanging symbol. No amount of work or organizing can improve our world unless it is rooted in spiritual awareness and compassion. And yes, I have spent a lifetime organizing, organizing, and activism, living out our faith is so important. And yet, of course, Jesus invites us to root it in a deep well of prayer and awareness and compassion, going deeper to what will transform people. Jesus' loving words, and they are loving to Martha, are an invitation to all of us to take a deep breath a breath full of the loving presence of Jesus so that we might see what God can offer us this day in this very moment and in this very room and possibly what God might offer through us to those around us. May we go forth today with quieter hearts and minds, making time to choose the better part. Amen. Amen.